Yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar with Comforter uh, featuring Max Schrems. Uh, we are happy uh, that you are with us today. Um, this is not going to be a PowerPoint webinar, just a few words in advance. Uh, There's going to be a discussion, so we are really looking forward uh, to the session. Um, yeah, Max Schrems, uh, author, activist, uh, you are well known already. <laughs> if you want to uh, introduce yourself, yeah, just take the chance. Oh yeah, um, I'm mainly a lawyer basically, and um, I'm an Austrian, but studied in the US for a while as well. And um, yeah, we mainly do privacy and, and enforcement of data protection. So usually data protection is largely like a compliance blah, blah, bubble where there's not much consequence if things go wrong. Um, and we are trying to actually enforce the GDPR as it is um, in two ways. First as, as a consumer right thing. And the other thing is also about the fair competition element in the sense that um, if companies just don't comply and there is no consequence, then the people that do comply usually wonder why they do. Um, and that's a second element. That's, I think, part of what we're doing as well. Well, OK, yeah, sounds sounds really interesting. Um, today's session, today's uh, discussion is kind of, uh, yeah, we split it in three parts. So the first part is going to be the story. Yeah, you're going to tell us a little bit about your, your background, uh, about the kind of REMS 1, REMS 2 rulings yeah, and uh, how this uh, all yeah, came together. Uh, then the second part, I think, is, is a very interesting one. Uh, we will talk about how to make it actionable. Yeah? For a lot of companies, um, this ruling GDPR um, is a very complex, is a very uh, uh, yeah, um, a difficult um, activity, is a very difficult um, um, uh, playground. Um, and a lot of people are wondering, actually, what should I do now? Yeah? What should I kind of uh, um, change in terms of my infrastructure, in terms of the te technologies I'm, I'm using? Yeah? So we'll dive a little bit deeper uh, on that. And then uh, the third part, um, which is also interesting, is can SRAMS 2 be an opportunity? Yeah? Is it not just something that uh, kind of stops transatlantic data flows, but really kind of holds something uh, for, for companies uh, in Europe uh, and in the US? Yeah? So, um, let's look forward to that. And yeah, um, if there are any questions, feel free to use the Bright Talk functionality, uh, type them in. Uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end of this one. And uh, yeah, if we don't get to it, uh, of course, um, yeah, feel free to add them anyway, even during the Q&A session. Um, and we might be uh, yeah, coming up, following up with um, some more answers after the webinar. And with that, I'm, I'm really looking forward um, to yeah, the first part of the um, interview of the, of the session today, um, the story behind uh, uh, um, yeah, the ruling and behind uh, and your story, basically. Um, yeah, how did the whole thing get started? What was your kind of, how did you get into the, uh, into the situation of, of um, yeah, fighting against the big, <laughs> the big brands? Um, yeah, I mean, I did privacy before, um, and I was studying for a half a year in California then, and it was interesting because we had some people from like the big players, and already back then they said more or less what they still say 11 years later, is, you know, all this kind of fundamental rights in Europe is kind of cute and nice, um, but nothing happens if you break the law, so let's just not comply, and that's more efficient than actually doing any of that stuff, and because that idea is so prominent and so dominant in, in, in the privacy world. I think we're now in the situation where it's like really hard to get a compliant product, where it's really hard to deal with all that shit, because if everybody around you doesn't really, you know, provide you with a service that you can just use out of the box and it's GDPR compliant, it becomes a huge headache for everybody else. Um, and yeah, fast forward, then a couple of years later, there was um, the Snowden relevations, and we then realized that it's not just what, I don't know, Google and Microsoft and, and, and Amazon or whatever does with that data. Um, but it's also that basically the, the US authorities realized, oh, um, if these companies are already spying on the whole world, we don't have to do that ourselves anymore. <laughs> we just tap into these big companies and pull the data out of there. And that is basically this um, uh, prism upstream, downstream as, as different programs. Um, and the interesting thing was that uh, once that was um, published, there was huge outcry, you know, everybody from Merkel all the way down to like um, each little member state um, was having their dramatic episode over this, um, but no one really did anything about it. And we then realized actually mm, without these big companies, it's not possible. So you can basically go after one of these um, big international companies and thereby hit the NSA indirectly. And the tool for that was the data transfers because in EU law, exactly for these reasons you're not allowed to send data abroad 
unless you can guarantee that it's safe abroad. Um, and that is exactly what these big, big companies can't do. Like on the one hand, on the European side, they have to provide privacy. And on the American side, they have to provide surveillance. And that, that conflict that you have there is basically what we try to use uh, to get probably a bit of a debate within the US also about surveillance. Um, I think that happened 50%. Um, and it's still the momentum there that the idea is, oh, the Europeans are not going to be serious about that anyways. We're just going to have some new deal. And um, and that momentum of really like pressure from, from the industry, um, but also um, really people moving away in bigger, in, in bigger amounts and also the European Commission at some point saying, you know, guys, there is no new deal because nothing has really changed in the US. Uh, these elements were then missing a bit. So we're still looking down to probably a Schrems 3 as we now hear with you know, like new deals. Mm -hmm. um, what I see as a problem is that the issue doesn't go away. And the issue is a conflict of laws. So the US basically says all of that is a violation of fundamental rights, but just of the fundamental rights of our own people. And as long as we don't surveil our own people, but only foreigners are good. And if each country in the world does that, we have an internet where everybody's under constant surveillance without judicial approval and so on. So I think in the long run, we need to get into a system where we have what they call a no spy agreement or like an agreement where you basically say there's reasonable surveillance with reasonable um, like approval of judges and so on, no matter if you're a German, an Austrian, a French or an American citizen. Um, and I think that's a bit the, the long-term plan, but that's probably down the road for a couple of additional years now. Awesome. Yeah, I, I get it. I mean, there are two, two streams if we talk about. There's one stream kind of why privacy uh, for today. We, we won't touch on that. Yeah, I think that that should be clear uh, for most of the people out there. Um, and there's the other stream kind of, it's not just about the big companies. It's not just about Google, Apple, Facebook. Um, and kind of going back a little bit to the history, we had privacy shield, or we had safe harbor, we had Schrems 1, we had privacy shield, we had Schrems 2, kind of, can you summarize quickly for those of the, of the audience in the audience who are kind of not too familiar with kind of the, the story uh, of how this went? Yeah, so uh, basically, as I said before, since 1995 in, in Europe, we have to rule that there is a general export um, prohibition on data. So the idea was we're gonna have a, a, level, a, a level playing field in Europe, um that make do, does away with different laws in different member states so therefore there's a free flow of data because no matter where your data goes it's protected um but if it then goes let's say to india and there is no data protection law there the whole system in europe wouldn't make much sense because you can just move data out of the eu and then do whatever you want to do so you have to have this export control element um which is not uncommon we have that in many other areas of law as well um the problem is that everybody ignored it since then <laughs> and it started with the us that um there is an option for the eu to accept a third country as being adequate so um let's say switzerland has a very similar data protection law it's reasonable to say okay we're basically doing the same thing here anyway so let's just do away with export controls here the only country that doesn't have a proper data protection law and also wanted to do away with export controls was the us and that was basically through threatening the European Union to sue them at the World Trade Organization to say your privacy is a hindrance to our companies, blah, blah, blah. And um, in this, you know, it, it fits very well into this idea of American exceptionalism. There's really no other country that got that deal from the EU other than the US. And already in 2000, people said, you know, there's really no law there. Why is there an acceptance? How can we accept that country, but not 100 other countries that, that are about the same? Um, so that was always criticized, um, but no one ever went after it. And after Snowden, the idea was to go after that. Um, I filed it in with the Irish DPC because at the time the Irish regulator was in charge of Facebook. Um, and when we filed, the DPC rejected the case and said it's frivolous and vexatious. So it's so absurd that it would never, it doesn't even warrant to be investigated. Um, which is very typical for the Irish DPC. They always find some reason to not do anything um, in each one of these cases. So Schrems 1 was really about, um, does an authority even have to accept a complaint like that? Um, and it was connected to Safe Harbor because the authority basically said, because Safe Harbor, this deal with the US is in place, they can't decide otherwise anyways. And um, that basically struck down Safe Harbor because I said, yeah, that deal should have never been there. So the deal is actually invalid. And the only one that can invalidate a European decision is the Court of Justice. So all local judges, local authorities, anybody 
has to kind of get this case to the court of justice so that they decide. Um, that was the first round. Then we thought, okay, this, this um, issue is settled. Um, we're gonna have um, the DPC decide. Instead of deciding, they came up with another very absurd idea, which was that they sue me and Facebook. So I was actually in Schrems 2, a defendant. I didn't want Schrems 2 to happen, to be honest, um, because the first case already settled the issue, like the Court of Justice was rather explicit on, in what it thought. Um, and in that case, suddenly Facebook also argued Privacy Shield, and then Privacy Shield became a thing um, in the case itself. And there we had the same issue that we said, you know, US surveillance law didn't change. Privacy Shield is text-wise basically safe harbor. So we called it lipstick on a pig. It's basically exactly the same thing, just with a new logo and a new headline on top of it. Um, and what the European Commission did there is that they basically had political pressure to issue another invalid law or another invalid deal, knowing it's going to be invalid, I think, to a large extent. If you talk to people, they were like, yeah, we knew, we knew the Court of Justice is going to kill it again. Um, but there was political pressure to just have some, some deal, hoping that that gets you over two or three years. Um, and that's a very kind of problematic trend, if you look at it, because if the European Commission is outraged about, I don't know, weird dealings in Poland or Hungary or so, and they themselves issue laws that they know is, is, are probably illegal, um, that is, is politically kind of interesting as, as a thing. Um, long story short, the whole case took, um, it cost about 10 million euros in Ireland. We had about 45,000 pages of documents, six weeks of hearings, just Facebook did everything to delay this case. The US government also did everything to delay that case. But in the end, it went back to the Court of Justice and the Court of Justice again found because A, there is the surveillance in the US, but also there is no redress. So if you're unhappy about surveillance, there's no court you can go to in the US. Um, they found that this deal is again violating the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And I think that's important to highlight. In the EU, we have um, these fundamental rights in the Charter. And to change them would require all member states to agree, um, you know, like without any kind of abstention. Uh, like we would literally have to change the European treaties to do that. So the, the reality is on the European side, um, we're not going to be able to overcome that. Like a lot of these issues that we talk about is not GDPR, is not something you can quickly fix in law and just you know, get over it. Um, we have very fundamental issues. Um, and talking about this, that there is no court in the US, imagine that we now have all these cases against, as I mentioned, Hungary or Poland, because the appointment of judges in the court is not 100% as the court, uh, as, as the European Union sees it to be, to be uh, proper. Now, our uh, US doesn't even have a court. So if you're the same, you know, if you're the court of justice and you adjudicate on Hungary first and say the appointment of judges is a problem, that's a violation of fundamental rights. And two seconds later, you have a U.S. court where there is not even a court. <laughs> um, then um, it's it's going to be very hard for the Court of Justice to come to any other conclusion, really, than than the ones that they had before. So I think we're in this in in a very long ping pong process where um, the political elites and also a lot of the industry just doesn't want that to be the reality, and they feel it's it's simpler to somehow get around European law or somehow not enforce European law mainly. Um, than to actually have reforms in the US because what we hear from the US is we can't even pass our budget because we are so so much hating each other in US politics. How could we ever get surveillance reform done? And I think that is that is a bit the problem that just um, on the European side, we would have to change our treaties. On the American side, you would li literally have to somehow fix the fucked up political system. And therefore no one really moves and we're in this in this situation that we're in. Mm -hmm. And I think why we're talking about that, um, for most of the companies here in the EU, I'm not talking about uh, the, the large ones, uh, kind of, we are, we are just covered, kind of, uh, even kind of Facebook or, or Google, who has a, who have a presence in the EU, but for all the companies who are doing business, yeah, who are really trying to find a way to comply on the one hand, and then on the other hand, uh, also kind of using new technologies, yeah, they have, they really need to come to a decision now, and they kind of are, not really convinced for one side or the other. Yeah? And that's why we're talking about it because really to make some plans, uh, to have a strategy in place, you need to understand what is the reasoning behind this? What is the reasoning behind uh, Schrems 2? Kind of why did we get here? Yeah? Um, and with that, I mean, that, that leads perfectly to the question. And I mean, you already uh, touched on it. Uh, what, what can we expect in the future? Kind of what we, we already heard about uh, the discussions between Euro, uh, European Union yeah, and the US about in the, the next uh, generation of, of privacy shield yeah what is your feeling what can we expect from that 
So, um, so far, we don't know the details of that new deal, but we know the headlines. And I don't think that much more than headlines exist. So we do hear informal stuff, and there is already behind the curtains meetings with industry where, where you hear where it's going. Um, that goes beyond what was publicly discussed. Um, and basically, they will have three things. They will have a um, what they call proportionality principle in US law. So proportionality comes out of European law, and they want to take that and put it in American law. That would be amazing if that would really be the thing. But they also said they're not going to stop their surveillance as it is. Now, the Court of Justice already found that this US surveillance violates the proportionality principle in the EU. So you can hardly just move that principle and not have a violation. So what we're probably going to see is that the US just says, oh, we have a different interpretation of proportionate. So we're just going to say, on the American view, that's all proportionate. And in the European view, probably not. So we use the same word, which is a typical, let's say, diplomatic solution. Like we can both agree that we use proportionality, but then just in reality means something else. So we don't get to a solution there. So that's apparently what they tried to do on that side. Um, on the court issue that there is no uh, place to go to, there used to be an ombudsperson on the privacy shield that was uh, taken apart by the Court of Justice as not uh, sufficient. They will probably use the same system and just bolster it a bit, like with more people on the panel, blah, 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 but still going to be an executive body. And that's going to be super interesting because, again, there's a lot of window dressing. Um, what they probably try now, is, as you hear, is that they will call an executive body, which is not a court, just it will get a nameplate being court. So the European Commission can say, oh, there is a court. And then we will say, but it's not a real court. It just is called a court, but it's actually an executive body in the, um, in, in the ministry. Um, so we'll, that's apparently the two new big things that they try to do. Now, I think once that gets to the court of justice, the judges will probably scream at it. Because if you're the Supreme Court of the European Union, you told the commission twice you can do that. And now the commission comes up a third time with like a court that's not even a court and proportionality that's not even proportionality. Um, I think it's a matter of like authority for the judges to probably say fuck off and, and we're probably going to be back at square one. So I think that is my current estimate. Again, we don't know the final text. We don't know the final version. So if there's some wonderful magic that they could agree on that actually protects Europeans data, I'm the first one to applaud and the first one to say, that's great, you, you did a marvelous job. Um, just from what you hear, it seems to be, again, mainly a political agreement. So there, all these things that I just talked about are talked about for one and a half years. That's not new. Um, what's new is that basically von der Leyen and, and, and Joe Biden got together and said, we're just going to have a deal no matter what. And that is, that is just not how law works. Like if you have a violation of a fundamental right, you can politically agree that you don't have it anymore. <laughs> That's the whole point of fundamental rights is that they sustain political pressure, that they sustain uh, political views that are different. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very skeptical of any new deal. So I think in practice, what most companies will do is they will continue to use the standard contractual clauses that they use right now. There, the big idea is that you have a transfer impact assessment and then come to the conclusion that everything the court of justice said is not the real thing in your case. Um, so everybody now does a transfer impact assessment and everybody realizes, oh, apparently all of that is true, but just for someone else, not me. Um, that's how transfer impact assessments right now work. And a lot of law firms make a shitload of money with that. Um, it's just funny because I never saw a transfer impact assessment so far, even the one of Facebook, which was literally the case in front of the court of justice. Even they came to the conclusion that the court of justice was just wrong. So um, it's, it's just total denial that happens there. But that's the one thing that the industry does is that they basically use the SECs. And the other thing is that they're probably going to use in parallel this new deal, the new privacy shield. That's kind of the denying option. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the other option is that people gradually look at what they can move somewhere else, what they can move to European provider, what they can somehow um, you know, have in-house or somehow get somewhere else where they don't have that headache. And I think that is uh, depends on the size of a company and what you do and what the products are that you're using. But oftentimes just moving shit to some place where you don't have a headache is just more efficient and more cost efficient as well than having 100 law firms trying to write some paper denying that the Court of Justice has said what it did not and what it said. So I'm, I'm seeing these two trends a bit. Um, some people that just want to get done with it and, and move on and not deal with this shit anymore. And that's more the host in Europe just don't have this whole transfer issue anymore. Mm -hmm. And then there's the denial fraction. And um, the denial part is still just using the big providers because that's what they've heard of and that's the standard to do. And, and 
that's kind yeah. of the, the other option. I think, I think that, yeah, perfect. I, I think that that leads to kind of the, the second part of our discussion uh, very well, kind of how to how to make it actionable. Yeah? Um, let's let's imagine I'm a an enterprise here in the European Union, yeah, um, and uh, kind of usually you have your on-premise systems, yeah, traditionally, but we see a lot of companies moving, shifting workloads to the cloud um, due to many various different reasons, yeah. Um, and, and you use as a service solutions like Salesforce, uh, you use Office 365. So there's a multitude of systems you can easily replace because they are already very tightly integrated into your uh, ecosystem. What does it mean for you? Kind of what can you what can you do now? What should you do yeah, um, to, to, to be compliant? I think the easiest solutions would be, and that's a problem in the GDPR. In the GDPR, the controller, so the end customer in the B2B relationship, so to say, is the one that's responsible for all of that, which is a, a problem in the law. It should be the processors that are primarily responsible because they usually have the knowledge and the also bargaining power to actually do something. So it's in a GDPR problem that the end customer, so to say, the commercial end customer, um, is liable for all that shit. So um, that means that basically the one option you have there is that you put pressure on your suppliers to say, I need to quit that service and so on. The problem is that that is a bit, you're usually not big enough. Like even I talk to very big customers of let's say Microsoft, they say, you know, we tell them we're gonna move away millions and millions of revenue, but they are still like, ah, we still don't change anything. Um, so that is, that is a bargaining problem to actually move these companies. Um, the other option that you have is to shift to um, alternatives. And for a lot of that, there is alternatives. I think one problem that we have in, in, in the IT industry is that everybody uses the one software that they've heard about and you have this total monopolization and then you have that one thing that everybody uses. Um, I can tell you for ourselves, we're 20 people now, we host everything ourselves. We usually use open source software. Yes, there are some drawbacks in certain elements, um, but a lot of it also works better and nicer. One of the things where we had the most headache, for example, is to find a, um, a newsletter tool. Because as a privacy organization, you want to have a new letter tool that absolutely doesn't have any tracking. And it's really hard to find one that does that. Um, and in the end, we found one um, that's hosted locally here in, in Austria. And if we had a problem with the API, I can send an email to the boss and they, they even change the API within day for something we needed, which you'll never get at any kind of these big companies. So I think that's, um, that's the alternative. And what you usually do is that you kind of look at what your exposure is. So what are the services that we have? Where is a lot of personal data? Where, it's some, where there's something where uh, NSA surveillance is most relevant? And then you usually gradually try to move these systems into something that, that is um, protecting your privacy and make sure that um, you're compliant. Um, and that is a process and that takes a while. Um, I think right now everybody was like hoping not to do that because there's got to be the new deal, the next thing, whatever. The reality is this problem is not going to go away for the next 10 or 20 years until the U.S. changes its laws um, or we come to one of these like more international no spy agreements. I think for the time being that problem won't go away and it will just come back every half a year. So you might as well just cure it at the root. I think some companies do that whenever they set up a new system or a new just transition to something else anyways. Um, I think, again, the easiest solution would be that a lot of these larger providers would actually have a fully GDPR compliant version for Europe, which means it would be hosted here, there wouldn't be access from the US, all of that. That would still be possible. There is the option that you say, okay, I have a European subsidiary, but I don't have factual access from the US. And that would allow to be, um, to be legal probably from both sides, uh, because the US says you have to provide that data as long as you have what they call custody or possession of control. So for example, if you have a server in Europe and you're managing it from the US, you still fall under the surveillance law. So a lot of the companies um, now have these really problematic advertisements where they say, oh, don't worry, you can host with us because we have a server in Frankfurt. Now, if the server in Frankfurt is managed out of Michigan, then you still have cus possession, custody, control from a US side. However, what you could do is that you say, okay, we, I don't know, produce the software in the US and do all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's actually then run on a separate entity in Europe where we do not have any access because it's a separate company where we have some layers in between to make sure that there is no access. That would be something that would probably be sustainable from a US and the European side. It just needs companies to reorganize, to change their IT infrastructure, their um, services, for example. And that is something that a lot of these big providers are simply not willing to invest in. Um, and 
Um, I think there what's missing is, is big fines, big penalties, big consequences, because these big companies really just do a spreadsheet and say, you know, how many millions do we lose if we lose customers? How many millions do we lose if we change that? And then whatever they think is, is more profitable, they will do. And right now it seems to be more profitable to be non-compliant. Mm -hmm. Got it. So, um, I mean, we have, we have two scenarios here. We have that one scenario. Okay. We, we want them to change. Uh, because of the kind of um, yeah, the in, 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 uh, in income. Uh, um, what is the right word? Uh, the, the laws are not fitting together. Yeah, you have yeah. the European law and you have the US law, so they are not. Uh, um, conflict uh, of law is the technical. Conflict word. of law. I was looking for that one. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so you have that. Um, so you could wait for the law to change, which probably kind of from summarization is not a good strategy because probably your DPA, your your authority here in Europe. Uh, will knock on your door before that happens. Yeah, we see already some cases, uh, especially here in Germany, where uh, the authorities are actually, uh, um, yeah, talking to companies uh, um, uh, and, and conflicting or confronting them with uh, kind of uh, fines for using uh, services uh, that are hosted in the US. Yeah? So we see that already. That's not a good. That's not a good one. You can put pressure on on the uh, um, uh, companies that kind of host those services, which definitely you should do. I mean. That's something uh, we, we want to see going forward because we want to use um, those very fancy uh, advanced uh, capabilities that and come with. Honestly, you're paying a shitload for it. I mean, it's it's a basic necessity that if you pay for a service, um, it should be compliant in the country that you know this is offered to. Um, so I'm oftentimes wondering this kind of um, feeling that you know we've got to be really nice that they actually sell a product that works. It's a bit weird because in any other area, you know, if you say, I don't know, I got a car that I'm not legally allowed to drive here because of some, I don't know, regulation, um, you would usually go to Audi and say, fuck off, and I want to get money with my money back for this car. In the IT industry, it's still kind of, oh, it's just not compliant, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the compliance was was long treated as a as something optional uh, yeah. because the functionality and the speed of the solution and the integration was uh, was what, what what companies and what people were looking for. Okay, so we have that second chance, which still, as you say, there's not much success in, especially the giants doing something in a compliant fashion. Uh, we talked about the third strategy, um, actually, um, yeah, replacing it with something local, which unfortunately is not always that easy. Uh, as you said, I mean, as a smaller company, you might kind of shift um, faster as a large company, as we all know, those projects can take years. Uh, which brings me to the um, kind of to another option we already discussed in advance, yeah, uh, where we need to clarify a little bit because GDPR uh, states that pseudonymization uh, or pseudonymizing the data and anonymizing the data uh, gives you some benefits, of course, uh, also some some drawbacks in functionality. Um, let's let's clarify first what is pseudonymization versus anonymization. We we discussed that beforehand, and I think we should make clear here um, uh, at this point. Yeah. Um, so anonymization is that you can actually not um, get that data back to an individual person. So that is, um, for example, rather useful if you just need statistics, if you need stuff that is where you don't have to get back to the individual later. Um, that's usually an option. And you usually have to do that anyways, because you have the duty of data minimization. So once you actually don't need the individual's person data anymore, you actually have to kind of anonymize it. Um, that's a general principle of the GDPR. And the interesting thing is once data is actually anonymous, you fall out of the GDPR. So the GDPR doesn't regulate you anymore and you can do whatever you want to do with that data. Um, pseudonymization is um, basically replacing your name or your clear identifier with a surrogate, which is usually a hash, a ID number. You can basically, if you think about, you know, good old online platforms, you just are not called Max Schrems anymore, but you're called user one, two, three. Um, but other than that, once you you can figure still, you can still figure out who user one, two, three is. That's basically the big difference. Um, pseudonymization is somehow mentioned in the GDPR for political reasons. So the conservative negotiator wanted to have more kind of leeway for pseudonymization. Um, so it is mentioned once or twice in the GDPR, but it's not a whole shift, it, you still fall under GDPR, you still have to comply with all the rules, and you still have to comply with the transfer rules. So you can't say, oh, I just made it pseudonymous, so therefore I can send it abroad. Um, there may be situations where you can say, okay, because only I have hold the key and because I did some really fancy stuff, 
um, I may have a smaller option that a, you know, the likes of the NSA would actually find out and would actually be able to use that data in any reasonable way, which gets you very close to the kind of the encryption idea to say, okay, I just scramble up the, da the data that badly that um, no one can actually use that data in a reasonable way anymore. And then you fall out under, um, then you're out of these, out of these issues. That could be a part of one of these kind of transfer impact assessments if it's done really well. The problem so far is that it's really complicated and it only applies to certain applications, certain situations where that's actually useful. So I personally haven't seen like an implementation where that worked well and where that made sense. Um, and it's very technical. You really have to check what works or not. Um, mm -hmm. One option, for example, if you compare it with encryption, um, there is, for example, the idea that you have just backup data that you encrypt in Europe, then you basically have to encrypt the data, you store it in a cheaper cloud somewhere abroad. That is, for example, an option where you can say, okay, I have a technical solution that even that data that's there, for example, a Google or a Amazon cloud provider can say, oh, I don't have possession custody control of that data because it's encrypted and I can't read it myself. Um, that's approaches that could work. Um, again, as long as the encryption key is with you, not with Amazon, because that's a lot of that stuff where you really have to look at each detail of it if, if it's sufficient or not. So for example, if the um, keys are with um, in the same cloud or even with the uh, provider itself, then under US law, they would also have to hand out the keys. So therefore it doesn't help you. And you basically just have something locked up where the key is right next to it. Exactly. So maybe just sum summarizing, I mean, with anonymization, there is no way back to the uh, end user, meaning uh, even if someone gets hold of it, um, analyzes it, you wouldn't be able to identify a specific person. With pseudonymization, things become a little bit more complicated because, um, and that's bringing us back to the main idea of Schrems 2 is we want to make sure that the end user uh, can be spied on, that it can be kind of identified and you can kind of yeah make some conclusions about uh, um, uh, yeah what the user is doing or what the interest is. Um, and as you said, in the past, pseudonymization, and maybe we can talk a little bit about that, um, was set it up in the wrong way or didn't really solve the issue. So, I mean, we talked about it, Google Analytics, for example, they pseudonymize the IP address. Yeah? So why is that not compliant? I mean, we, we probably know, but what is your, what is your take on that? Um, on the IP address, I mean, that's even anonymization if you do it the right way. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is that um, Google at the same time had all the cookie data with it. And then the cookie data, you had the user ID. So it's, it's kind of cute if you anonymize one data field and you have five next to it that are definitely personal data you don't, you don't really get anywhere. And that's in general with a lot of that rather complicated because once you have, for example, free text, you don't know what people put in that free text field. Uh, there may be an email address in there. There may be something else that is a, a clear identifier. Um, so it's oftentimes not that easy to really make sure that you have, so to say, clean data. Um, that is then really fully anonymized. And, and that gets you into very, very technical engineering problems mm -hmm. um, that you have to look for each software if it's done the right way or not. Yeah. So generally speaking, what we also find with customers, and I mean, I'm, I'm bringing in a little bit from the kind of uh, encryption uh, data security company side here. Uh, we, what we also see is data clean rooms, for example, where they just pseudonymize the identifier and the rest of the data is in the clear. And then you end up with stuff like mosaic effects, um, where you basically from the rest of the data, knowing that, okay, it's a male person living in that address, uh, having that IP address, having that interest, you can create the picture or you can you know, kind of get back to the, to the identifier somehow. And with that, the entire idea of pseudonymization that is there in the GDPR isn't really uh, uh, yeah, uh, supported. Yeah? So what we usually usually suggest is a, is a new form of pseudonymization, which essentially is looking at the entire data set. You have to keep in mind that you, you need to protect all the data. Yeah? You need to make sure that you pseudonymize wherever that is okay yeah? and anonymize wherever that is good enough. Yeah? Uh, and there are various different technologies available for that. You can mask the data, you can encrypt the data. One concept is tokenization. We, we won't touch on that today, but that's a new form of kind of um, encrypting the data in a way that the keys stay in Europe and the data is protected um, in its protected state in wherever you need it, for example, Salesforce or data analytics environments. But as Max said, that's a smarter way of doing it. Yeah? It, doesn't, it requires you to really understand your data uh, and to yeah, look at the entire data set, yeah? not just the identifier. Yeah? So that 
uh, is, is not a solution. Yeah? If you have that in place, you should definitely uh, think about it because uh, that's not compliant. Yeah? One other aspect I just wanted to bring in, uh, and uh, maybe a question to you. Most companies we are working with don't really understand what data they have and where it is stored. Uh, kind of what, what is your feeling on that? Kind of what is, what is your experience? Yeah? I, mean, I had the feeling that, even, yeah, I mean, even when we talk to faith, I think most of their people don't know how the system works. Um, we're generally in a in a state where there's so many layers of, of technology on top of each other and the, everybody relies on each other, um, that that's really a huge task to even understand these things. And I think a lot of that, um, if you would have privacy by design, if you would have software that is uh, having the law in, in, in the mind when it's, when it's drafted, when it's written, you probably avoid a lot of that problem and you could probably have a lot of that done with two clicks. Um, we're now oftentimes confronted with a software stack that is just absolutely written in a non-compliant approach that, that sifting through all of that and getting idea is really complicated. I can tell you even for us, I mean, obviously we, we, first of all, we're only here for three or four years. So we could actually think about all of that when we started any software project. Um, but once you use some external software, it's, it's oftentimes really, even if it's open source and all with all good intentions, uh, not that easy to figure out what, what really happens and what data you store where. So for example, we probably overdo compliance compared to anybody else. Um, but it's interesting because you can see software products that really have GDPR baked in. There you have one button and you can see it and it's easy. Um, and then you have every, everything else where it just is a, a maze of, of different things to figure it out. We usually, for example, oftentimes then go into the raw data and go into the database itself and try to figure out what happens there more than the so to say front end uh, software that, that just captures that and manages it. Um, because there you usually see more of what's really going on. Um, but that requires some technical skills, some, some people that actually know how that stuff works, which not every company has. I mean, a lot of, it's easy to install software, but it's not easy to actually work with it. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So what, what was funny, maybe a little anecdote, we, we have been to events uh, and kind of explaining how we tokenize the data, how it is protected, how we how we support privacy. And then most of the CISOs or most of these uh, security experts on the other end, they said, yeah, that's awesome. I would really like to do it. I don't know where my data is. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's why we actually onboarded a, a, a discovery solution to help them find and understand their data landscape, uh, because that's already a complex task. Yeah, really um, giving you that complete picture of where, example, for example, EU citizen data is. That's, I mean, you find PII, that doesn't necessarily mean is that European citizen, is that a, a US citizen? Yeah, and then as, as an uh, international company, you need to make that difference. Yeah, because of course, very. If, if I may add, it's not citizenship; it's mainly uh, market based. So if you're on that market, and if you're a European company, you have to apply GDPR globally anyway. So even if you have a US customer. Um, that makes it even more complicated because mm -hmm. even if you would have a field citizenship, um, there are situations where you're not protected on a GDPR as a European citizen, and there are a lot of situations where you're protected as a non-European as well. Um, so that stuff like that is really not that trivial, and a lot mm -hmm. of the law is not really thinking as technology thinks. So a lot of that is 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 easier said than done, and implemented and properly implemented without. I can tell you, for example, there were discussions about having a law that protects European citizens in the US. I was like, you know, all I need is a Chinese living in Berlin because under European doctrine, it's a human right that applies to any foreigner as well. While if only European citizens are protected, I know, I think half of my friends may not be protected. <laughs> so um, that that's all much more complicated. So oftentimes it's easier with a broad brush to kind of just say, okay, we're just going to comply no matter what. And, and it's easier to just say we do full compliance globally than, than to actually try to differentiate there. Mm -hmm. And that's at least what I hear mostly of, of companies that really try to do the right thing. Awesome. Okay, cool. So let's summarize. We had the first, first parts talking about the history a little bit. Yeah. And uh, what we kind of, what came clear is, um, there will no, there will be no solution, no easy solution in the next month, yeah, because there is basically uh, an, an underlying situation that that uh, yeah needs to be solved. So um, we need to have that in mind when we look at our kind of corporate strategy to comply, because that kind of um, yeah inf uh, kind of uh, impacts drastically what is coming in the next uh, few years. If I may, if I may yeah. interrupt you for for really short for one for thirty seconds. I think if you have a conflict of law situation from non-lawyers, it's basically two trains colliding. You just have too much law. 
and anything that's in between it is going to get crushed. Um, as long as we don't change the law, that's going to be the reality. And it doesn't help to have an additional agreement in there. It's just too much law that conflicts. And that agreement will just get crushed, like, just like say Forever and Privacy Shield did. So the idea of adding another layer in between of a crushing train is just technically not possible. <laughs> and I think that we can do a lot of like, you know, footnotes and legalese and so on. But fundamentally, that's what a clash of jurisdiction is. When one jurisdiction says A, the other one says B. And unless you change that, you're going to have that conflict and you're not going to be able to avoid it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that that summarized it, it pretty well. Yeah. So um, in, in, in essence, uh, what you need to do now is to kind of see what solutions you can replace, maybe with something local um, to see what solutions you need to stick to, because it's far too complex. Yeah. Drive those providers really uh, kind of make sure that they understand that there is some uh, pressure behind it. Yeah. Uh, even if you use a small as a service solution in the US, for example, you need to make uh, make them aware of of the law and need to make them aware of uh, uh, of the situation, yeah, and also pseudonymization, as you said, um, do it right. Yeah, if you do it, if if there is kind of a, 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 a thing you can do, like anonymization, pseudonymization, don't do it the wrong way. Keep in mind, you need to protect the privacy of the individual, yeah? not just do something that, um, yeah, is uh, uh, lipstick on a pig. I uh, to 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 <laughs> remind of your blog post. Um, and with that, let's jump to the third part, which is um, turn it into an opportunity. I think, uh, Schrems 2, we just talked about a lot of disruption. Uh, we talked about a lot of changes um, that are going to happen uh, in the future. Um, is there an opportunity that Schrems 2 bring, bring to the market? Um, um, yeah, I think um, in different layers. I mean, first of all, I guess it's the first big shock that the privacy bubble had in a long while where they're like, okay, this is actually serious. Um, for a long time, GDPR was more of like, yeah, Let's hire someone and give it to someone illegal and just to get done with it. Um, so I think that is, is in general a big um, helper, so to say, for the cause. Um, we, we definitely see that data is not moved abroad that easily anymore, as, especially when it becomes to more sensitive data. And also thinking that that's not just a privacy issue. If you're in industry sectors that are typically relevant for espionage, you probably don't for business reasons don't want your data to go abroad like i was you know talking to people in like finance and and oil or whatever industries they know that they want that they definitely not gonna put that stuff into a cloud because um then it's going to be gone rather soon not just from the us side so i think that is an additional element to consider you know if you're a relevant player here um and the the other big opportunity is that we may have more local and and more local growth here as well i'm not I gotta say, I'm not a big fan of that idea. I'm I'm more of a globalist that, that thinks, you know, whoever does it the best in the world should do it. Um, but that may for certain areas um make sure that there's some industry here as well that that will um you know provide for the European market. Um and that oftentimes then also comes with different moral values. So we see software solutions that we buy from Europe or that we get from Europe um usually have a different mindset as well and you can feel it if you use it that it's more natural for us to use so to say um so i think that is that is an interesting element there as well um and we may see more of this kind of um let's say innovation in privacy so it's it's usually this word innovation was captured by the big tech industry to say whatever we do is innovative and whatever anybody else does is not and I think that could be interesting that we see that, you know, for example, having a very privacy friendly product, a product that your customers will like as well and not feel spied on or so is innovative in that sense as well. And I think we oftentimes have to recapture um, that because we, to be honest, most of the solutions we switch to, I feel way more comfortable using it's much more, you know, what we really need than, than the standard software that's out there. So I think that is, in, again, it depends on the sector that you're in and what you need. But there is these alternatives that oftentimes are, are really nice to use. And that's open source where you can add a product or a model and, and say, OK, I want to customize that element and be absolutely perfect and perfectly happy with, which you're not going to be able to do with like Microsoft 365 or so. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Yeah. So for 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 larger companies, they need some kind of some of those solutions. Or if we look at US companies who have kind of data of EU citizens, they need to find a way to protect that sensitive information. Yeah. So 
uh, I think keeping all the opportunities in mind is really important. Yeah. Uh, one and other one thing, thing that, that I forgot to say, sorry to interrupt, um, no, absolutely. It's just to, to really break this monopoly building as well. I think a big part is that we really got into a situation, look at Microsoft, for example, you can do on-premises, a lot of that stuff. You have to move in their cloud. It's not that customers necessarily want that. They just don't have any other choice anymore. And I think that usually in the long run will make companies extremely um spend a shitload of money on that because once you're locked into these systems you hardly get out anymore um and may also financially not make that much sense we all know that it's kind of like online streaming they just go up with the price until there's a breaking point and and once you're in you once it's not your own system anymore or not a a competitive system anymore you will oftentimes suffer on that side as well and think we're we're definitely have a lot of companies that realize that now gradually that they pay a shitload of money for each little software as a service uh, that just adds up over the month as well. Mm -hmm. I think hopefully uh, we will see someday uh, the laws actually uh, being compliant to each other. Yeah. Uh, until then, what I also read was what was quite, uh, kind of interesting with, with Kubernetes and all those kind of, um, I, I would say layers you, you have uh, in the cloud where you can easily shift workloads from one place to another, um, kind of due to the fact that we now have those Kind of localization slash uh, uh, um, kind of uh, yeah different data centers you use for for different uh, uh, groups of customers with those new technologies it, it will be easier and they see also a a yeah, an increase of use um, because of uh, of those regulations so I think it's also a great great thing which even in the future will be beneficial kind of with any law you can move your your solution around a little bit yeah um, the only thing they need to solve probably is manage it from from Europe as we heard. Yeah. Cool. And with that, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy. Thank you a lot for, for yeah, providing us some background and, and giving us your perspective on, on how things are moving forward and uh, kind of on, on Schrems 2. Um, yeah, we will get to the Q&A. Um, and let me just check uh, what question we got. Uh, I think that question was, was quite early. Will there be a successful privacy sheet uh, 2.0 in the future? I think that was, a, that was an early question. Uh, maybe just as a summary. <laughs> in very short terms, I mean, on what we know, the likeliness is no. And I think even people in this industry are very critical of this new approach. Um, I would give it a two, three, four percent chance to probably survive for some random reason. Um, but that's really an outlier chance. So it's, it's you know, as likely as, I don't know, Russia winning the Eurovision Song Contest. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Not, not, not too likely. Huh? Okay, so um, EU, EU data centers. Um, there were a couple of questions regarding EU data centers. How, how likely um, do you see that uh, companies like Microsoft will manage from the European Union? Do you see some movements uh, in that space or is that something that is not happening? I think we're seeing preparatory work. I mean, the reality is data centers in Europe grow like mushrooms for all different reasons, um, a lot of technical reasons as well. Um, so this global cloud is oftentimes very local anyways. Like I can tell you from Microsoft, uh, from Facebook submissions that they say in reality, your data is stored in a European data center anyways, because of latency and all these kind of reasons and performance reasons. Um, so the next step to actually seal that off to a certain extent is, is probably not far. Um, and not very complicated for these companies, um, especially if it's not interconnected services. So if you have your one cloud software that is running, you know, separate from other stuff, it's rather simple to do that. It's much harder, for example, if you look at, my, at Facebook being a global network, you would really have to kind of cut that more in pieces. Um, but that's not the normal software as a service situation where you usually have one instance or one customer and you can divide it up by customer rather easily. Um, so I think that will happen rather soon um, because it's the most straightforward, the simplest and the cheapest option to, to get that issue solved for good. Mm -hmm. All right. And with that, we are kind of uh, at the end of the 45 minutes. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for, for answering the questions. Uh, we will do another Q&A round uh, probably and then uh, kind of, yeah, do maybe a second session. Uh, and yeah, just as a summary, I think uh, it was a yeah, great session, a lot of insights, I think also uh, helpful to kind of plan the strategy, understand the landscape. And of course, there's more to it. Uh, there is some legal advice needed. Yeah, that's uh, that, that little disclaimer we need to make. Yeah, uh, if you if you uh, have specific um, use cases or issues you want to look at. And also from our end, from Comforter side, uh, if you want to learn more about our data discovery solution, we didn't touch uh, we didn't do an advertisement session today yeah, uh, about data discovery or about the uh, pseudonymization 
encryption anonymization technologies that we have for data analytics use cases as a service uh, solutions can reach out to us and yeah we will answer your questions and with that enjoy your day and yeah see you soon thanks a lot